I, uh, I was very excited to come to Greenland because I knew it was a place I was unlikely to, uh, to, to visit but always wanted to visit. It's a very remote part of the world and so much of my life is um, driven by professional needs so I travel to go to conferences, to, uh, to go to universities. Uh, the idea that we could have an academic event in this setting is almost unimaginable. Um, so for me it's a, it's a kind of dream. But much more than that I think it's been an extremely rewarding experience because of the people who are here. The organizers were, ex were really showing a, a tremendous amount of courage and, uh, and I think uh, creativity to bring together people who disagree, people who fundamentally uh, disagree about the nature of the mind. And to try and orchestrate a conversation between these different sides uh, is an enormously valuable and illuminating opportunity for all of us. Qualia. Uh, well, qualia are the root of what's sometimes called the hard problem. They are uh, thought of as properties of our experiences that we are aware of. Uh, when we reflect on what our experience is like, we're aware of it having a, a quality to it, the quality that it is like to see colours, blue of the sky, green of the grass, the sound of, uh, of a musical note, the feel of something on our skin, the pain of an injury, what it is actually like to undergo these experiences, how it affects us, how it impacts upon us. I guess that's what people mean by, by qualia, but that's an illusion. It's, qualia are an illusion. What we are aware of when we talk about the quality of our experience is just certain features of our brain, of our brain state. But I do, I mean, I, I mean we are artificial intelligence, we are, we are robots that have been constructed by natural selection. I keep saying, how could... You, you come to Greenland and there are still some people who deny the existence of qualia. <laughs> <laughs> just, yes. just experience. It's just an illusion. Tell me, tell me all this is an illusion. I have access to and would be surprising if I'm wrong. Yeah, sure. I think that the, our knowledge of the evolution of the brain has got very little to give us at the moment about the evolution of consciousness. We don't understand how consciousness is instantiated in the brain of a contemporary human being and for the same reason we don't know how to trace it back to the brains of our ancestors. I think we can already explain some things about consciousness, about color for example, we talked about that the other day. I think we'll learn that conscious states are states and activities of the brain, I think. Tononi's theory is essentially that there's a, a threshold for the amount of inf information integration and once that threshold is passed then yeah, the <laughs> awareness sort of em emerges. Yeah, I mean but he's not, but he <coughs> confuses the different def definitions of consciousness anyway. I'm confused. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the philosophy of consciousness. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, thing is not impossible itself, I mean that we see a two-dimensional picture of it and then we according to our, I don't know, experience... You're not two you this is a three, this isn't a two-dimensional, this is a three-dimensional object. No, I mean that when we, from the two-dimensional picture now, for example, I see a two-dimensional picture of oh, these yeah. mountains yeah. and I have the experience that if I'll come there I will feel the mountains you don't like... See a two, you see a three-dimensional picture of this mountain. So you, I, you mean that we, due to our bin, 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 yeah. binocular vision, yeah. but our bin, binocular vision uh, gives us three-dimensional vision maybe for like this fence I can really see in three-dimensional vision, but what's... Uh, what's yeah, but you have all sorts of other cues, size, perspective and things. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't, you know, I think but the, the, the you're saying you could, you, you could Use a three-dimensional, a two-dimensional display to mimic that, that scene, and, and you would interpret it in three dimensions. I don't think you see it in two dimensions. Do you? I, I, I don't think so. <laughs> well, so I mean, I mean, for the I think it's like saying when you look at a patch of yellow, you you see it as red and green, but you don't. You don't actually see what lies. You know. No, when I say two-dimensional, I mean uh, uh, that. Uh, look, we can change this. Uh, all this landscape, all this scenery with a big picture, yeah. two-dimensional picture, yeah, but and we will see no difference. No, but you're, that you're making a different point, which is that, okay, the, the two-dimensional display c can generate a three-dimensional model in, in your head, yeah. But you don't see it in two dimensions. Yeah. Well, well, 
Oh, okay, I hear that. I lost, I lost my no, but you might, you might say, well, you know, like when I hear what I'm actually yeah. hearing is, yeah. is oscillations in, I mean, in, my, in my cochlea, but you're not, you're hearing. <laughs> Breakfast. Yeah. And so there's some neuronal death and there's some pruning back of extra branches and so forth. And that happens in puberty. So that you actually end up at the end of adolescence having a much more thinly populated cortex than you did at, say, age 11. As they make greater and greater connections, suddenly you have the capacity to have, for example, stereoptic vision. Does that affect your panpsychist uh, <laughs> intuitions? I mean, do you think that this is also an evidence for panpsychism in some way? Uh, I wouldn't say it's directly evidence of panpsychism, yeah. but as data, I suppose it is interesting that and Akuto are questioning the existence of consciousness and this is, I guess, the ultimate test, isn't it? It's such a vivid, most incredible conscious experience I can remember. So this would be, if we can look at this and still think consciousness is an illusion, that would yeah. be the test. But could you, this could be a powerful illusion. Uh, very, very powerful. <laughs> the, what, we, what there has been, which has been very interesting for me, is this 
exploration of the illusionist view that consciousness is an illusion. And although I joke about it, I think it's a very important view. That they are taking consciousness very seriously. They're yes. so impressed by it, they, yeah. they think it can't possibly fit into the material real world. So in a way, that's... That's, that's one way to respect consciousness. Sense, yeah. He just asked me if I yeah, if I have hope yeah. in the next four or five days of convincing convincing Dan Dennett that he's wrong. And I said, no, I've been at this long enough to know that's not going to happen. No. Yeah. I tried to Approach. tell them was wrong from the get. And me too, and that's something we could agree on. Yes, we can. In fact, in fact, for the life of me, as I said to to, uh, to you in the in the in the piece on the on the singularity. I don't know why you're not a type A materialist. Yeah. Uh, I, I was listening to the, the new skipper uh, talking about what, uh, how he was going to handle the boat. And he said the main thing to remember if you're going to handle a boat is um, as, as little as possible, as much as necessary. And I think that kind of nicely sums up Dan's take on, uh, on what gets into the mind too. As little as possible, but as much as necessary. So it's the, the core argument here. I think the core claim in uh, all Dan's work here, is that there's just no need for and no existence of double transduction in the brain. So there's no role left here for transduction into something else, these qualia that we've been talking about along the way. There's no need to, as it were, take all those incoming energies, turn them into something uh, kind of qualitative and experiential in some difficult sense. And I think that at least I put this on the table, if we could answer that question to everyone's satisfaction, that would be the end, where there'd be no need for like cruises like this, that would be a shame, but you know, that would be the end of the qualia wars. So there's the inversion, it's not the sweetness that explains your response, it's your response that constitutes the sweetness. And that's the same account, I think, as we're going to get of qualia. It's not that the qualia explain our responses, or drive our responses, or are some sort of secret um, data that we need to do justice to. Um, instead, they're simply, as it were, uh, names for dispositions, complexes of responses. It's to replace worries about qualia with um, research on content. In essence, what you do is you say, okay, I'm going to treat all of this qualitative stuff as content stuff because it's the content stuff that explains all of our reactions, explains what we say, explains what we do, it's how we build machines. Um, why not stop there? So basically, you know, when you, when you um, experience a baby as cute, you expect to feel like cooing, nurturing, um, stroking, whatever people do with babies, I'm not quite sure, but it's all, it's all to do with cute stuff. And at that point, you diagnose yourself as having detected something that's nonetheless a little bit puzzling, given our view of the world. We've kind of detected cuteness in the world, but that seems like a, a slightly strange property at first, not quite like cameraness. The same would be true of redness, although it... So, provocative summary. Qualia, I think, Dan is saying, are just more content items in our best model of the world. That's what they are, if they're anything at all. <laughs> we'll come to that. Why is this molecule, where's the ineffable sweetness come from? You're just looking in the wrong place. The sweetness has got to come out of an interaction with, with a perceiver. That's just a non-issue. What we have to account for is the set of reactive dispositions. There's, there isn't any extra thing. Now, now, screw up your head and think about it for a few seconds. Oh yeah, I can conceive that. No, you can't. No, you can't. If you think you can, you're simply underestimating the problem. One of the things we as philosophers face, you know, every hour it seems, is Wilfred Sellers' problem of how things in the broadest possible sense hang together in the broadest possible sense. The consciousness message is a defense of physicalism against uh, David Chalmers, among others, uh, via the open possibility that introspective representations represent mental properties as having features they actually lack. But we don't have the kind of free will that is required for what Dirk calls basic dessert, but that's okay, we can live fine just without it. Your own phenomenal states may not have the properties it seems to you flat obvious, they do have, which you know by introspection. If you think of it this way, here's the physicalist say, ah, we can explain it all, and David Trump would say, no you can't. 
And then we come back, yo, yes we can, cannot, yes we can. And you get this back and forth. And he comes along and says, hang on, you're both overstating the case. Don't you both recognize it is at least possible that you can't. That, in other words, that David's conviction that his introspection get, delivers truths about phenomenal properties, that that might just be a mistake. He's not saying it is. I'm saying it is. Um, so if, you, if the phenomenal inaccuracy hypothesis is correct, then got the question, and, and, and those concepts, those very concepts that Dave likes and I like, you think they refer, and they refer, but they refer to brain states. So the question, do those brain states bear those resemblance structures? And I, I can't see what, you, if you say yes, then it seems like that's a real fluke. What, 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 about, the, 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 what about the analogy to color again? Okay, if you say no, then it seems like they don't really refer, because that seems like well, a well, I don't know. Why, why, can't you, why can't you draw the analogy to color again? So like, the thing is, our ordinary right. view of color is primitive color, and they colors bear certain kinds of structural relationships to one another. There isn't primitive color, we all agree, but right. that it, there's still, there are still structural relationships uh, among the various molecular bases for spectral reflectance profiles. I mean, so, I mean, why couldn't the same sort of thing be true in the phenomenal case? But, I mean, there is another option, which is to expand our conception of the material world in order to accommodate qualia. So on this approach, you take the information we get from the physical sciences, and our immediate awareness of qualia as both equal sources of data. And this really seems to be the position that, where you really can have your cake and eat it. You don't have to deny what seems apparent. You have no problem with mental causation, no clash with science. It's elegant, unified. I mean, I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but I, I just really can't engage with that position. Um, like many people couldn't engage with evolution. Because, you know, it's too wacky. Until there's evidence for it. I just, yeah. There is absolutely no sign of anyone needing to invoke any of these sort of wacky properties, anyone needing to talk about absolutely intrinsic properties or about you know, uh, 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 non-physical properties or whatever in explaining how the mind works. There's absolutely no pressure for it from anywhere. But um, you might say, look, qualia are very, very weird things. Therefore... We should be dualists. That would be one kind of position. Dualists. But when you change your perspective on it a little bit, you discover it's not so uh, weird after all. It's, a, it's just an illusion. So that's, that's the illusionist perspective. Qualia seem weird. They are weird, but they're only sort of intentional objects. They don't really exist. They're projections of the imagination. According to a standard materialist view, merely being in the right physical state, in the right brain state, is tantamount to having an experience and therefore in that extent directly and immediately knowing what that experience is like. So you can have a count of phenomenal knowledge of what it is like to be in a certain uh, sensory state that's based on the fact that just being in that state constitutes a form of knowledge. And again, people like Paul have, have argued for this. So I think a materialist has some account of immediacy that's just built into the theory. We know qualia through the qualia, not through something else. We know it directly. And finally, on infallibility, you might say, well, of course, and this, this is the point I, I made a second ago, of course we know we're very fallible. We make all kinds of mistakes. But those mistakes might issue from the fact that when we present our qualia uh, conceptually, either for our own uh, self-descriptions or when we're trying to describe to others what we're experiencing, we need to translate what we're experiencing into something like language or some sort of conceptual um, repertoire, which might be very, very different in its um, expressive scope than, than the quality of themselves. And there's all kinds of room for, for error here. So I don't believe in the existence of philosophical qualia. You look inside, so to speak, and upon looking inside, you are aware of certain ongoings in yourself, and those ongoings appear to have qualitative properties. I think this is completely crazy. Nothing like this exists, but one might insist, in experiencing, we are phenomenally presented with qualities at least sometimes. Color is the typical case. Sounds, smells. Now, we, we might use the term quale for this kind of whatever it is. And I call them presented qualia. That phenomenal consciousness is an illusion. 
Now, as I said, I take this to be an illusion. <laughs> if you think to, you believe that phenomenal consciousness is an illusion, you are under an illusion. You are misinterpreting what you really want to say. And what this implies is that, of course, if you have some nice materialist theory about qualia, in the sense of presented qualia, you haven't solved the problem about consciousness, because experiential properties still are there to be explained. Right? Well, now when I have my arm up there, I'm aware of it, and I'm aware of it in a way that shows up in the phenomenology of my present state. It makes a difference for how it is to be in my present state, whether it's up or down. I think that those people who try a reduction of phenomenal consciousness or of consciousness to court, when they formulate the basis to which they want to reduce, they often talk about cognitive structure. Right? And then they use certain concepts in describing that cognitive structure. And my observation is this. I'm certain that in using those concepts, they have a, very often implicitly a subject presupposing reading of those concepts in mind. Okay? I'm a dualist. As, okay? But I don't think that being a dualist in the sense I have in mind makes me someone who believes in magic or mysteries or the supernatural. I'm a naturalist. And you take it seriously as an interlocutor. Now, now you adopt heterophenomenology towards that complicated uh, uh, bunch. And if the issue arises, are you making a mistake? Because might it be a zombie? I said I was a bit surprised to see that there was a, a 70 40 uh, or 70 50 uh, ratio who wanted to pursue some approach different from the one I had, I thought, convincingly outlined for them. Uh, why, why do you suppose that is? Oh, he says, uh, the last class before you got here, we read David Chalmers. <laughs> Whatever science you have, uh, it's still not going to deductively entail anything about phenomenal qualities. It's not going to explain anything about that dimension of our mental life. The idea being you could know everything there is to know about the physical brain or the physical nature of our sensory states and you still wouldn't know that um, problematic dimension which is known as uh, the phenomenology of our sensory states or the phenomenal properties, the properties that are immediately apparent to, to consciousness. Uh, as I mentioned a few moments ago, David is almost unique in taking this recommendation seriously. He doesn't just fold his arms and sit back and say, to materialism. There might be proto-phenomenal uh, properties, which are properties of the real world, and they show up at uh, the atomic level or the subatomic level or the quantum, quantum level. It explores the way in which uh, certain features might be uh, added to current theory and the ways in which they might throw some light on the curious case that is the, the human brain, at least, and uh, its uh, conscious experiences. We should pursue any opportunity that presents itself as potentially useful. And what's going to decide the issue between competing approaches is which one comes up with the greatest explanatory success. A pan-proto-psychist, uh, sorry, proto-pan-psychist, um, pan <laughs> pan-proto-psychist uh, 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 approach has a priori as good a chance as anything. Pan-proto-psychist, that's it. Uh, right, okay. Pan-proto-psychist. I did have it backwards, that's right. Uh, um, pan-proto-psychism. Proto-pan-psychism? You, pro <laughs> pan uh, 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 you shouldn't expect deductions. Uh, there is this widespread myth, especially amongst philosophers, that explanation or interthoretic uh, reduction is simply a matter of deduction. And, well, deduction is indeed important, but it's something that happens only after and only because you have 
postulated some identities across the uh, theoretical divide. Uh, so the explanatory argument uh, makes a false presupposition about uh, deducibility and uh, is, at least to someone uh, who uh, thinks like I do, not a, a serious argument at all. Uh, namely, Kripke and semantics for modal logic. God help us. The third argument was the knowledge argument. And there I line up with a, a variety of people in the profession in agreeing that the principal mistake involved there is an equivocation on nose. We still need a compelling account of what's going on there. The knowledge argument, and there's a lot to say about those things. My own view is that actually the explanatory argument is the fundamental one here. Phenomenal consciousness one needs to explain more than the functions. Explaining consciousness is not, as an explanatory problem, the problem about explaining various functional roles. And this is where the you know, this distinction between the easy problems and the, uh, the hard problem that's received a lot of attention is basically just a way of encapsulating that basic distinction, the problems of explaining these various functional roles and the problem of explaining consciousness. Now, there are some people, like Dan Dennett, who think that, uh, that no, in fact, all we need to explain is explain the functions, um, you know, the responses, the reports especially, and in doing that we'll have explained consciousness. That's a line which uh, Keith and Andy and others and Nick have been embracing eloquently here. I should say that I don't take myself to be committed to, uh, to panpsychism or pan protopsychism. I take it as one of the, uh, one of the options, um, but not, certainly not. Uh, the only option, and there are many, um, there are other sort of, you know, more conservative forms of dualism, for example, where we just say we've got, phys you know, we've got physical processes and psychophysical laws and consciousness connected to that, and that needn't be panpsychist. So you, sometimes this gets, I get, sometimes the fight gets brought up with something like neuroscience versus dualism, or neuroscience versus panpsychism. You said, well, there's the neuroscientific, the brain-based program, and then there's this other program, which is something like a panpsychism or dualism and so on. I think this is complete. I think this is completely the wrong way to uh, to look at it. Neuroscience versus dualism, or neuroscience versus panpsychism, is not a uh, is not really a fair contrast. One is a uh, you know, one is a philosophical thesis, and the other one is a uh, is a uh, is a research area. That consciousness is a fundamental property of the universe, and then there's at least this very natural and attractive option, panpsychism, which has the which has the potential to satisfy many of the theoretical constraints on the mind-body problem, which are very hard to satisfy. You call it a council of despair. I say, no, it's to... The dualist side offers nothing. Again, the core neurobiological um, theory here is just neutral on physicalism versus dualism. And that core neurobiological theory is the one that has the explanatory successes. Physicalism doesn't have the explanatory successes. Neuroscience has the explanatory successes. For panpsychism, look, I don't claim there's any great explanatory successes of panpsychism, yet panpsychism is an underlying fundamental theory that's a speculation. That it's very difficult to decide what the data are, and that's exactly what we are discussing all the time. Right? It's a substantial philosophical issue to decide what needs to be explained. So science can't ever decide alone which theory is better. I don't think it's true that philosophy has to decide beforehand what the explanandas are. So I don't see a crucial role for philosophy, except that I think the philosophy is continuous with science. I'm a Quinean, in that respect I'm even a type Q materialist. Uh, uh. Heterophenomenology is a method which goes from people's convictions about what they're conscious of, takes the, their statement of conviction as the primary data. Now, there's a good reason for that. So heterophenomenology is a neutral scientific method for gathering what has to be explained. 